Good afternoon, everyone. This will be my video lecture in legal aspects in the tourism and hospitality industry. Today is September 29, 2022. It's a Thursday afternoon. So we move on to a new topic, which we will be discussing later on. <coughs> now, I will be giving you your assignment number five, also after my lecture. And I suppose that you are doing, or you have done already, assignments number one up to number four. Okay? So we proceed with assignment number five later on. And, and uh, it is up to you on how you are going to present your assignment. Because I am giving you the leeway by which you could present clearly and succinctly all your assignments. Okay? So last time, we talked about the three... Well, these are the major uh, forms of business organizations, major forms, legal forms, no? major legal forms of business organizations. No? And we talk about, of course, this will not be our topic anymore because we are moving to a new topic, as I said, but this is just a review. The first is what we call sole proprietorship. No, wherein you are the manager, you are the boss, you are the owner of your own business. And this one's the easiest to form. No? Easiest. And cheapest also to form. And of course, uh, easiest, the cheapest, and the most flexible. No? Most flexible. <laughs> now the second is what we call partnership. A partnership is a contract uh, whereby two or more persons find themselves to contribute what are they going to contribute MPI no money property or industry to a common fund with the intention of dividing the profits among themselves later on no and of course the most <coughs> complicated of the three would be the corporation no the corporation this is the third form of business organization. Of course, corporation, if you are uh, envisioning no, that your business will be bigger than what you think today, you form a corporation wherein how many incorporators do we need? 5 to 15 incorporators to sign the... Which document are they going to sign? What we call the articles of... Incorporation, and that is how you create your own company or your corporation, of course. No, but as I told you before, there is no hard and fast rule as to which is the best form of business organization. But what I said, which is very important, is that before putting up your own business, you need to prepare what we call the feasibility study. No? And in your feasibility study, of course, it is very essential to undertake what we call the environmental scan. You have to, uh, of course, you have to scan or search for the appropriate market that you intend to put up your own business. And you put up your own business, say, for instance, a travel agency, because of a need. No? This is the guiding principle in putting up your business. There is a need. Okay? So before I proceed, of course, um, once you have put up your um, the appropriate business organization, there are a lot of contracts and obligations that you need to sign. Because in engaging in business, definitely you'll be dealing with your suppliers, with your customers, with your other stakeholders, no? And in the process, of course, there will be legal documents that you need to prepare and sign. So what are these documents? Now we will take up this time what we call another topic, which I told you. The topic that we will be discussing today will be on obligations and contracts. No? 
So the topic that we are taking today, or we will be discussing today, will be has something to do with obligations and contracts. Now here, the particular provisions where you could find now this uh, substantive aspect of the law would be in the new civil code. No, in the new civil code. So for today, we will be taking up Article 1156 and 1157 of the new civil code. No, so when I was still in law school, this subject has to be taken for a semester. But in your case, of course, for purposes of complying with legal aspects in the tourism and hospitality, it is only contained, uh, uh, this one, this topic, will just be one of the topics that will be discussed within a semester. So you could see how, uh, <coughs> how short are we going to discuss this topic. It is only one of the subjects that we will be discussing in your uh, legal aspects, no? in your course, no? just a semester. No? So let me start. Of course, <coughs> when we talk about obligations and contracts, these are two separate ones. No? But uh, of course, we have to take this first, obligations. Before we proceed with contracts, for you to easily understand what obligations are. Okay? So, may I erase this now so that I could concentrate on obligations? Because the topic on contracts will come later on, after you have already an overview of what obligations are. So, what are obligations, or what, what is an obligation? Now, an obligation is a juridical, no? according to Article 1156, it's a juridical necessity, juridical necessity, no? it says necessity, juridical necessity uh, for what? It's a juridical necessity to give, no? so to give. to do and then of course there's a negative of this not to do no not to do so we call this there is a juridical necessity to give to do or not to do and this ones this are what we call prestations no <coughs> prestations it's not presentation no but it's prestations prestations no <coughs> So, again, I repeat, in an obligation, according to Article 1156 of the New Civil Code, when I say NCC, it's the New Civil Code. If you would like to uh, review, of course, you find the uh, New Civil Code of the Philippines. So, it's a juridical necessity to give, to do, or not to do. And this ones, these obligations that I mentioned, are otherwise known as prestations. So, how many prestations do we have? There are three. Okay, let us discuss this one by one. Now, when I say it's a juridical, it's an obligation to give. So, to give, meaning you have to give something, a thing. You, know? you have to give a thing. You know? Whether movable or immovable. You know? And in the case of immovable property, of course, this one is evidenced by title evidence by a title say for instance a land no? it's an immovable property so you do not bring you do not give the land physically but what you are going to deliver or to give would be the title no? in the case of a thing say for instance a furniture for instance of course it's a ch chattel so you have to deliver that no? to deliver a property so in short an obligation to give will refer to the delivery of a thing or and that thing could either be movable or immovable property clear so uh, what are the examples of an obligation 
to give, no? say for instance, a sale, no? a contract of sale or a donation agreement, no? donation, what are you going to give here as sale? would be, well, the thing that you purchase. Say, for instance, if you purchase a refrigerator, for instance, from somebody or from a store, the uh, obligation is to deliver a refrigerator. Now, if you donated a property, a real property or a movable property, of course, as I said earlier, the one that you will be delivering will be the title itself over the land. Okay? So that is the first one obligation to be, to give a thing or to deliver a thing let us go move on to the second presentation which is the obligation to do no this time to do this is also an obligation to do but of course to do it will cover what what are we going to do here no so in here it will cover all kinds of services it will cover all kinds <coughs> of services no? and these services could either be physical physical services or mental no? say for instance physical if you engage or you constituted a contract for a painter to paint your, say for instance, yourself or your wife, for instance, or your girlfriend, no? So here, the obligation of the painter when you engage in services is of course to make the painting for your uh, wife or your girlfriend, no? Or your father or mother, as the case may be. So that one, it may be covered by uh, a contract. No? so that you constitute an obligation to do no? I said all services whatever services that is whether mental or physical or you engage say for instance the services of a singer for a 3 hour show for instance and that is also a kind of service no? to do ok this is the second prestation or this is the second obligation that I mentioned we go now to the third one, which is the obligation, negative, not to do. Obligation not to do. So what are the examples of this, not to do? Say for instance, uh, uh, for not to do, uh, there is a rule no, in the building code. <clears throat> Say for instance, of course, when you build a building, or when you erect a building in a community or in a certain barangay or community, of course, your obligation is not to obstruct the view of your neighbor. No? Not to obstruct the view of your neighbor. No? So there is a prohibition for you. No, you cannot do that. Or say, for instance, there is an obligation not to do, to erect a building uh, or to uh, construct a building that will create, say, for instance, a noise. No, because that one will already be a nuisance. No, or even in the case of, say, for instance, noise or uh, say it will create pollution. For instance, no, you cannot do that. No, you cannot. Uh, erect or construct a building that will be detrimental to the community because it will create pollution pollution for instance so, so that those ones are examples of an obligation not to do now we are talking uh, first about obligations no so when we talk of obligations of course, an obligation is a juridical necessity to give, to do, or not to do. Now, let me mention to you the parties, no? contracting parties in an obligation. No? Contracting parties. So, who are the parties in an obligation? Well, we call that, uh, we call the uh, first, the creditor. There is a technical term for the creditor in law, legal parlance. We call that the obligee. No? 
And in the case of the detour, we call that the obliquor. Okay, remember these terms, no? These are technical terms. Obligi and obliquor in the case of detour. Now, let me ask you, which one has the right to demand the fulfillment of an obligation? Is it the creditor or the debtor? Sino yung pwede niyang mag-demand ng performance? Which one do you think? The creditor or the debtor? Of course, the one who has the right to demand performance of the obligation would be the creditor or the obligee. Clear so far? And the one who will perform the obligation would be the debtor or otherwise known as the obligor. And these ones, uh, we will study later on the essential requisites or requirements for an obligation. Okay? So I'd like you to remember that the creditor is the obligee, the debtor is the obligor, and the creditor or the obligee has the right no, this one has the right to demand <coughs> the performance of an obligation. No, it is the obligor, I, or the obligee rather, or the creditor who has the right to demand the performance of the obligation and who will perform the obligation who will, who, who will uh, perform or comply with the obligation it is now the debtor no? it is the debtor who will comply the fulfillment it will comply the fulfillment of the obligation okay clear so far so i'd like you to remember this te technical terms obligi for the creditor and obligor for the debtor so these are the contracting parties in a in an obligation that you may constitute no let me repeat what are the prestations again or the obligations that may be constituted well these are obligations to give obligations to do and the obligation to not to do no? not to do and these obligations are otherwise known as prestations prestations or obligations simply obligations okay clear now in obligations we have what we call the essential requirements and requisites no? these are the essential elements essential elements of obligations no? without which essential elements of obligations without which what there is no obligation that is constituted so in short there are four by the way there are four essential elements of obligations and this four must concur no? meaning all these four have to be present in order that a constituted may be uh, in order that an obligation may be validly constituted no? they all must concur or they must be present no? so what is the first one what is the first essential element of an obligation well, we have what we call the active subject. The active subject. Who do you think is the active subject? As I explained earlier, is it the creditor or the debtor? Who is the active subject in obligations? No? The active subject is the one who has the right. Who has the right to demand the fulfillment of the fulfillment of an obligation so who is he is he the debtor or the creditor no as what i have explained earlier who is the subject uh, who is the active subject in an obligation it is the creditor no? or 
the other term for creditor would be the obligee. No? The obligee. No? The creditor or the obligee are one and the same. Clear? So we have the first element of an obligation which is the active subject. Now we move on to the second essential element. If we have the active subject, well, we also have the passive. No? We have the passive subject. And the passive subject is the one who is the passive subject? Is the one who has the obligation, who has the duty, no? who has the old duty to comply or fulfill. No? He has the duty to comply or fulfill the obligation that was constituted. And who am I referring to again? As per my discussion earlier, well, the, this person is, is it the creditor or the debtor? This time, the passive subject is the debtor. What is the other term for debtor? It's the obligor. No? The obligor. Clear? So far, so we are through with the second essential element. We move to the third essential element of an obligation. No? So the third essential element of an obligation is what we call the prestation or object. No? Prestation or object of the obligation. Prestation or the object of the obligation. So what are the prestation again? What are the three prestations that I mentioned to you? Well, the obligation to give, the obligation to do, the obligation not to do. So the prestation, or what we call the object, the object of the obligation is what is other now, otherwise known as the subject matter. No, the subject matter of the obligation. No? Subject matter usually, of course, it's the prestation. No? What kind of obligation has been constituted? Is it an obligation to give, to do, or not to do? And finally, the fourth essential element of an obligation is what we call efficient cost. No? The efficient cost is the reason why the parties constituted the obligation and this efficient cost is the juridical type we are referring to the juridical type that has been <coughs> created by virtue of the agreement of the debtor and the creditor the efficient cost is of course the juridical type there is another term for this it's the vinculum no? it's the vinculum the juridical tie that binds between the debtor and the creditor. No? The efficient cost is the juridical tie. No? That's why we have the uh, creditor, we have the debtor. Now, okay, remember that there is a tie, no? tie that binds them together as an object. And usually, of course, the efficient cost the juridical tie is created by virtue of a contract. Diba? There is a contract, the vinculum that binds them together. Now, I will go back to the subject matter. No? The third one, which I mentioned, the object or the subject matter of an obligation. No? The subject matter or the object. Or the object of the obligation of the obligation now here when I'm talking about the subject matter again I told you that we are referring to the prestation and this prestation of course there are three that I mentioned prestations to give to do 
not to do. Here, this prestation has economic value. No? Has economic value. No? Has economic value. Or this prestation would be susceptible to what we call pecuniary estimation. No? This prestation may also be susceptible susceptible to pecuniary. Pecuniary meaning money. No? Pecuniary estimation. No? Here so far, so here the prestation or the subject matter has economic value. That is the reason why these two people enter into a contract. And this prestation of course will be what we call the subject matter of the obligation. I think I have introduced to you the basic principles on obligations. We start from there, then we continue next time. No? So you have to write your assignment. Uh, your assignment would be this, no? because I am also monitoring your assignment. Assignment number five. <coughs> this one will be assignment number five. Okay. First one is, of course, Okay, let me do it this way. So, here. first one is I'd like you to, uh, of course, we are already on obligations and contracts. So, I'd like you to list down 10. You know, number one would be list down, list down 10 specific contracts. You know? List down 10 specific contracts. Now, in the following manner. No? So, you have the transaction here. You put, you make a matrix transaction. Then, of course, the name of the contract. Name of the contract. No? And then, of course, here would be the contracting parties. How do we call them? No? The contracting parties. So, example. No? Contract, contracting parties. What do we call the parties there in the contract? No? Contracting parties. So, for instance, your transaction is sale, for instance. No? So, here, the name of the contract would be contract of sale. And the contracting parties would be definitely the vendor and the vendee, etc. So here you have to be very specific as a transaction and then of course the name of the contract and the parties. No? And then that's number one. No? Number two. Number two would be give me five reasons. No, you cite five reasons why you need to read. Why you need to read the stipulations of the contract before you affix your signature. I repeat, uh, you cite or name five reasons or you mention five reasons why you need to read the entirety of the contract before you put your signature or before you affix your signature to the contract. No? And then number three, which is this one. What is a contract this is number three. No? What is a contract of adhesion? Contract of adhesion. And then, this is letter A. Letter B, what is an aleatory contract? Aleatory contract. Now, after giving the definition of this and that, you give examples. No? You give examples for... A contract of adhesion and a con aleatory contract. An example of aleatory contract. Now I repeat number three. What is a contract of adhesion? Contract of adhesion. And then letter B. What is an aleatory contract? No. After giving me what are these contracts, you give me an example for each one. Okay. I think that is all for today. Good afternoon everyone.